Okay. Hello. Uh, welcome to the CS61 review session. I am wearing AirPods because we're not sure whether we're recording sound, so we're trying to record sound redundantly. Uh, yeah. Woo! That is so that's hilarious. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I definitely don't want to hear myself. That would be incredibly obnoxious. Questions? I'll either go down the ones that we've got posted, or y'all who are in the room can ask questions. But ask questions. We've got me, we've got Garrett, Wonder Garrett. Garrett's his middle name. His first name is Wonder. I'm serious. What are your questions? What can we do to help you feel comfortable about the test on Wednesday? Lavanya, you had some good questions. Oh, no. Lavanya, I know that you would have some good questions because I value all of your contributions. Okay. You can ask other people's questions because who will know? They're all anonymous except to me. OK, thank you for asking a question of any kind. Okay. Okay. So the question was the high level question was can you under, can you explain what happens uh, when a function call occurs on the stack? The specific question was about one of the data representation questions that had to do with overwriting uh, the return one. Sorry, one of the assembly questions that had to do with overwriting the return address. Um, I'm very happy to do this for whoever asked that question. Okay. Um, so uh, people draw stacks in different ways. I, I draw all of the diagrams in this class as horizontal rectangles. Uh, we also sometimes see stacks as vertical rectangles. Let's say that we're in a function f, and in that function f, we're going to call a function g and uh, pass it some arguments and use its return value. Okay. And let's say that at the time that the G function call is made, RSP points here. Uh, what do you know about RSP already at the time of the function call? You actually know many things about it. If I were to say, hey, uh, the value of RSP is 1,000 you'd be like, no, that's unlikely because you know what region of memory the stack pointer is generally located in. Namely, like what's a plausible stack address on x86-64 Linux? 7FF, F, 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 C, 0, 3, 2, 4, something like this, right? So it's got a bunch of, it's, it's like almost, two to the 47, but not quite, okay? So you know that. What other things do you know about the stack pointer? Do you know about how it relates to any of the other registers? Do you know about other aspects of its value? Leading question, you know things about both of those. Do you know anything about how it relates to the base pointer? Where is the base pointer expecting to be pointing? If the base pointer is being used, it's going to be over here, delimiting essentially. So this is F's RSP. This is F's RBP. And when the base pointer is not being used as a, an extra general purpose register, um, and normally in the assembly that you looked at, the base pointer is only used as a general purpose register in a leaf function, a function that doesn't make any function calls of its own. Okay, so if a function does call another function, then the base pointer always follows this layout, which I'm about to describe. And this function f does call another function, right? So usually what the RBP points to is like one past the return address 
So the entry sequence, uh, I'm trying to be aware of where that camera is. The entry sequence for a function often begins with push Q RBP, move Q RBP, RSP, excuse me, RBP, right? So I'm, I'm using this as, a, as an opportunity not only to answer your question, but also to like nail on a couple of other concepts. Why do we push Q RBP? What kind of register is RBP? It is callee saved. Yes, thank you. You're going to do great. Okay, so, so we need to save it at the beginning and we need to restore it at the end. Okay, so F's RBP points here. It points at the saved RBP and just before the return address of F. Okay? So you know a relationship between RSP and RBP. Yes, Max. Which side is the Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. That, these are higher addresses. So the stack is growing this way. Stacks grow down from higher addresses towards lower addresses. What else do you know about the RSP? There's one more thing that you know about the RSP at this time. It is a multiple of... Sixteen. It's a multiple of sixteen, because stack frames are always aligned. Okay. So this is a multiple of sixteen. We're almost ready to call the function. I'm going to call the function now. So what instruction does the call to G correspond to? Does it correspond to ret? Thank you, it corresponds to call. Um, so the call queue instruction, what does it do at a high level? It decrements the stack pointer by eight. It stores the return address, which is the address of the very next instruction in the stack space that it just created. And then it sets the instruction pointer to the called address. Okay, so. This is the entry RSP in G. Okay. Now you, so this is like the entry sequence. Um, if I were to continue through this entry sequence, one of the things that we might find in G is we might find G doing push Q RBP, move Q RSP RBP. If G was a complex function. If G was a very simple function that was using RBP as a general purpose register, it might not do this, okay? But if G is a complex function, we'll get another RBP. And then if G has local variables, G will subtract a large number from RSP. It doesn't have to be large, right? But it'll subtract some number from RSP proportional to the amount of space that the compiler has decided to reserve. And then in the exit sequence, those things are undone in sort of like reverse order. So first we'll add a bunch of numbers, uh, add that number to RSP, and then we'll pop Q the old RBP, and then finally do a ret Q, which pops the return address off the stack and jumps to the corresponding address. Okay, so that at a high level is the function entry and exit sequence. So I have a feeling though that this isn't answering the question that you wanted answered. Which problem number is it? The circumstances in which you can overwrite the return address. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
So um, let me now go into an example of a specific G, okay? And then that will show how a modification to a local variable in G can overwrite this return address. So let's say that G looked like this. I'm gonna give G, you know, an argument, which is X, an int argument. Um, and I'm not going off the specific question because I still don't remember exactly what it was, but we'll do the, the high level overview. And let's say that I have a local variable called buffer in this function that consists of, I'm gonna make it a, a buffer of longs that consists of eight longs, okay? And let's say that the first thing that I do in this function is set buff to zero. So buff is a variable that is being used in this function. So the compiler is not going to be able to throw away this variable. It can't just elide the variable because the variable is being, I'm assuming that the variable is being used. Okay, and then at the end, I say something like buff x equals nasty face. Okay? So buff is a local variable. Where are local variables stored? They are stored on the stack. What does the compiler do when it sees that it needs to um, allocate local variables on the stack? Well, it computes some size. That's like an upper bound of the amount of size that all of the local variables need. Um, if the compiler is optimizing, it is able to say, oh, well, your X variable is only used in the first half of the function and your Y variable is only used in the second half of the function so I can put them in the same space. So the compiler will do some optimization, but here for this simple example, we know that the compiler has to reserve on the stack at least how many bytes? Sixty-four, yes, 64 is the right number. So one of the instructions that we might see at the beginning of this G function is sub Q, you know, hex 40 from RSP. Hex 40 being 64, okay? So this is the entry RSP in G. We move it back by 64 bytes. Uh, 64 is an, uh, we'll, we'll return to this number, okay? And that might give us this RSP, which is G's RSP. And this is also the address of buff, which is the only local variable that I put in the, in the stack frame. All right. What value for X will overwrite the return address with an evil face? Sorry, what was your name? Franklin. Eight. Eight will override the return address with an evil face, right? This is buff zero, buff one, buff two, buff three, buff four, buff five, buff six, buff seven. And then buff eight goes beyond the allowed range for this function's local variables and will start smashing data that, belong, that, that needs to be protected. Okay, so this is an example of when something that looks relatively innocuous, namely buff bracket X, right, can smash, you know, either the return address or variables in the caller or the caller's return address, any number of things we can smash. Okay, so um, let me return to something else. I was going to say that 64 is actually an unlikely number here. It's unlikely that the compiler would generate this instruction at the beginning of a simple, uh, at, at the beginning of a simple function that didn't modify RBP. Any ideas why? This is, this is a real thinker, okay? So if you don't understand, if this doesn't seem obvious to you right away, that's okay, right? 
but if you rem if you think back to some of the entry sequences that we've seen, we've seen things like sub Q8 from RSP, sub Q24 from RSP, sub Q let's see, uh, sub Q40 from RSP. These are all numbers that are not multiples of 16. They are eight off of a multiple of 16. And that is the case because the return address plus the local variables should be a multiple of 16 big in order to keep stack frames as a multiple of 16. Okay. Now I, 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 I hear pencils scribbling. It's very unlikely that we will ask a question that requires you to remember this factoid. But like it's the kind of factoid that we might ask about in some questions because it brings a lot of things together, right? It brings together your experience in the classroom, the fact that you know about like the alignment on x86-64, the way stack frames work. Okay. Does this answer your question? Great. Can we have another question? Yes. If they're a leaf function, do they need to be 16 byte aligned? No, they don't. So G, as I wrote it, is a leaf function. Leaf functions can do all kinds of interesting things. Um, the lecture notes talk about the red zone, which is one of my favorite names in computer systems. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we actually touched it in class, but uh, the red zone is a leaf function can actually modify stuff to the left of the stack pointer with smaller addresses than the stack pointer, which is actually much more efficient than explicitly marking off space. More questions, Garrett. People want me to go over arena allocators. Okay, I will go over arena allocators. I will go over data rep 15. There was a question over here. What's your name? Nathan? Matthew. Yeah. Is there a particular reason why you want to, I'm just repeating in case that didn't, is there a particular reason why you want to allocate the space at the beginning rather than piecemeal? So um, this is, there are reasons. Um, I would say you could allocate the space piecemeal. The danger of allocating the space piecemeal is that that might, uh, th that gets complex for the compiler to, 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 to work with, right? You will often see local variables referred to in assembly as offsets from RSP. And if the compiler doesn't know what the value of RSP is at a particular point in its own generated output, because like, you know, for instance, maybe there was an if statement and one branch of the if statement like allocated eight more bytes than the other. Makes sense? Uh, hopefully that example is, is helpful. Then the compiler would find it confusing. Like, you know, what, how, how can it refer to a local variable? It can't use RSP anymore because it can't predict its value. So that's a, that's a fuzzy reason why this design uh, it, it is the way it is. Okay, let's take a look at data up 13. I am, bup, 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 bup. Okay, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is writing a program that needs to allocate and free a lot of nodes where a node is defined as a key, a value, a left, and a right. She uses an arena allocator. Um, true or false, this arena never has external fragmentation. This arena never allocator has, never has internal fragmentation. I think these are words that we have not used this semester. Um, so uh, the answer is let's see this arena certainly has external fragmentation and i think it has internal fragmentation as well but i think let's not actually discuss that because that would be introducing a new concept um chimamanda's friend of me paul oster not my favorite writer notices that if many nodes are allocated right in a row every 1024th allocation seems much more expensive than the others okay so let us stop there. This 
the way that these tests work, um, the way that I that the way that we find people do well on these tests is not necessarily by looking at a huge bunch of code that gets shown to you, such as an entire arena allocator written by a Nigerian American author, and then try and figure out exactly what's going on in that code without reading forward into the question. So I think that um, just as at some points during the bomb, it made more sense for you to try and solve a problem by working backward from an explosion rather than working forward from like, what does the very next instruction do? Um, you, you'll reward it here by working backward from like a specific fact rather than from trying to understand code when it's presented all at once. So the specific fact here is that every 1024th allocation seems much more expensive than the others. Now the, the question explains that, why that is, but when you look at the code, we're on data rep 13B, can you see why that is, why that would be? So arena allocation, recall, is uh, we use a special purpose allocator to make the active allocation cheaper. And a special purpose allocator can be cheaper than general purpose allocator because it's designed for a special purpose. For instance, maybe all of the nodes being allocated are freed all at once. We implemented a special purpose allocator of our own in, uh, at the end of the data rep unit. So what makes this allocator special purpose? What is its like overall strategy for allocation? I think someone probably doesn't have a key to get into Max Dwork and wants to be let in. Yes, what's your name? Lennon. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's a basic strategy for allocation. What I'm looking for here is that like the allocator actually allocates 1,024 nodes all at once. And it initializes 1,024 nodes all at once. This is in node alloc. You'll notice that there is an if statement that says if there's no free nodes, then allocate a new group. Initialize all of the things in that group, 100% of them and then link them all to the free list all at once. So that's why every 1024th allocation is more expensive because it's doing 1024 times as much work as the other allocations. Um, please feel free to like speed me along if this is going at the wrong pace for you. Okay, so Chimamanda decides instead to allow a single element of the free list to represent many contiguous free nodes. The average allocation might get a tiny bit slower but no allocation, but will be much slower than average. Here's the start of her idea. So she implements, uh, let's, let's draw a picture. The old allocator, when it wanted to make a new group, it created that new group by doing the following work. It allocated a new group structure, which contains 1,024 nodes in it. And then it hooked this group up to the arena and then hooked all of the nodes up to a free list. Okay, so this was the original allocator. The new allocator is trying to get away with doing less. And the way that the new allocator gets away with doing less is it uses a part of the node to represent this free information. So I'll write down the code. 
What Chimamanda has done is she says g nodes zero dot key equals a thousand twenty four. And then g nodes zero dot next equals null pointer and a free equals at g nodes zero. Okay. So there's no question marks in that portion of this code. This code is like the entirety of the initialization of a new group. The rest of the work of this allocator is being pushed to the normal node allocation. Okay, so how does this picture look different from the old picture? Well, we have some links from group to group just as before, but now our free node just points here. And now what you're asked to do is you're asked to make this a correct allocator. So I think that there's a there's a sort of a light bulb that needs to go over uh, go on over your head before you can answer this question. Um, but does the diagram help you? Does the diagram help give you a little bit of a light bulb? What's going on? What logic is Chimamanda using here? So the way that allocation used to work, the way that allocation would work in the old version is that to allocate a node, we would find a pointer to the first free node. There's our pointer and then move the free pointer to point to the next. Okay. That's how allocation worked. So now this first node is allocated. We want the same thing to happen here, the exact same thing, but now there's no next. What is there instead? Can you decrement the key to keep track of how many is still free? Great. Yes, we could do that. But that wouldn't tell us how to get the free node, would it? Or would it? Can you use pointer arithmetic to solve this problem? Yes, you could. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. So what we're going to put in this, in, this, uh, in, this, in, this, in this question mark here you say n equals a freeze. And then um, without looking at the solution, which means that I will get this wrong, you might say that there's two branches. There's two possibilities for, um, for, for how this code should go. Either this is a single free node or this is in a group of nodes. How can we tell the difference between a single free node and a group of nodes? by looking at the key, right? The key is gonna be greater than one if it's in a group. So if n key is greater than one, now I can see two ways to make this work. One would be that we take the free node from the end of the group. And one would be that we take the free node from the beginning of the group and then sort of replace the free pointer. Let's take the free node from the beginning of the group. Okay, so just as in this diagram, what I want to happen is I end up with a pointer to that return to the user and the free pointing there. Okay, and pointer arithmetic will let this happen. So n bracket one dot key equals n key minus one. And bracket one dot next 
equals n arrow next. A freeze equals ampersand n bracket one. Okay, so that's essentially marking the next element of this free node array as having one fewer free element in it, and then changing the freeze pointer to point there. What's the else branch? The else branch is when I have one free node, and there I just say a freeze equals n next. Okay. Ask me questions, please. Yes. Is there a way to free things you've already used? I believe that, that's, that there's another question about that. Write a node free function that works with the node alloc function from the previous question. What a, what a great coincidence. What, what was your name? Jeff. So, okay, so let's write a node free function. Okay, so l l let us step back, okay? So what is the format of a freed node entry? Okay, so every node in this data structure has a key, a value, and a next, right? It might, it, or it has a left and a right, and hopefully we will not at, actually get to the left and the right. <laughs> the right is used in the free list. So when I wrote next, I should have written right, doesn't matter. So previously, the free list only used the right pointer. It used it for next. Every element of the free list was a single node, and the right pointer pointed to the next free node. If it was null, then, then the free list was empty, okay? Now, we have a different design. Every free list entry has two meaningful uh, uh, components. The key equals the number of contiguous free nodes of which this node is the head. And the right pointer points to the next free element. So when the user frees a node, how many nodes are they freeing? How many contiguous nodes are they freeing? It's always only one. That's what that interface does every time. It frees exactly one node. So what should we do to that node to make it a valid member of the free list? You said it's key to one, right? So you say n arrow key equals one, n arrow next equals a freeze, a freeze equals n. That pops the freed L, uh, node on the head of the free list and also marks its key with the correct value so that it's not mistaken for being a, a part of a contiguous range of free nodes. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. What's it? Coleman. Coleman and Conlon. Okay. Coleman. Sorry. It's linked to the top of the free list there. Yes. Let me let me erase this and just do an alloc and a free. Okay. And I'll zoom into it. So we're going to start off with a completely empty um arena so it has no groups and it has no uh freed elements alloc will say there's no freed elements we need to allocate a new group it allocates a new group and links that group in this is the next group which this question has nothing to do with i'm just drawing it for completeness then we have an array of 1024 nodes only the first node is meaningful. It has the key 1024. 
it has a value, it has a left, and then it has a right, aka next, and this right is empty. This free freeze pointer points to this node. Okay, so now we do an allocation. I'm going to redraw the diagram. So when we do an allocation, we go through this logic. We see that we have a group of nodes, not a single node. So we need to do some pointer arithmetic and do some manipulation of the data structure. What I hope that this code does is that it takes this data structure on the left and turns it into this data structure. Key 1023, not 1024, uh, right, empty. Freeze is now pointing here, and this is the return value. Okay. Now, let's say that I free this returned value. What I want to happen is that the free list should look like this. The whole data structure should look like this. Usually in free lists, the freed element is put into the front of the free list. That's how this free list is organized. It's a singly linked free list. So the freed element is the first thing in the free list. The freed element has key one because every freed element always has key one because elements are freed one at a time. Its right pointer points just to the next node because that was the old head of the free list. That has key 1023 and right empty. Then there's 1022 more empty nodes whose values are completely meaningless. Yes, yes, yes. The way that this particular allocation strategy works, though, there will only be one node in the system at a time that has key greater than one, right? Because we'll never allocate another group until we run completely out of nodes, and we only use nodes one at a time. We never coalesce the freed nodes into a group. Okay, it is my estimation. I'm happy to answer more data rep questions, more questions about arena allocation, but it is 840, and I think we should move on to something else. Did you have a question? Please. Uh-huh. What is the one? One. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. We have like, it's about going from this picture to this picture. We have a group of 1,024 free nodes. We want to remove just the first, but we don't want to lose the other 1,023. We need to hook them back up to the, uh, to the free list. Okay. What I'm taking advantage of here with n bracket one is the fact that these nodes are in an array. So the address of the next node in this 1024 node group is n bracket one. Or it's ampersand n bracket one. n points to the first node in the array. So because of pointer arithmetic, the next node in the array is pointed to by n plus one. It's like named by n bracket one. Ampersand n bracket one equals n plus one. Equals one bracket n. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> this is like actually a true thing about C. n bracket one is valid. So is one bracket n. <laughs> This is because of pointer arithmetic. If 
n bracket 1 is the same as star n plus 1, and addition is commutative, then you can do this, and then you get to 1 bracket n, and the whole thing is just, it's like kind of cute, but I mean, come on, people. Uh, C++, uh, okay, I am wasting your time. Uh, more questions, more questions. Yes, Garrett. How do you approach the Hello Kitty image transformation kind of problems? You'll notice that we have been teaching this class uh, for eight years, and there's been exactly one Hello Kitty-like problem. So just like keep that in mind. Um, so here's how I would approach this Hello Kitty uh, problem. So the Hello Kitty problem says we have a bunch of functions and we have an image of Hello Kitty, which is represented, it's a bitmap image. And so the ones are black and the zeros are white. Then we have a bunch of other functions and we say, well, what do these different Hello Kitty images do? Um, this is a case where it would be good to project, but uh, so we'll start the projector at some point here. Um, if you look at though at these different Hello Kitty functions, there's some that sort of like a lot of these functions are actually hard to understand what they do, but you can look at a function and figure out some consequences of the way the function is written and then apply those to the images. For example, um, let's take a simple one, uh, data rep 5a. I think this is laptop one. So data rep 5a. Hopefully this is going to come on. Is that it? No, we still. Okay, what does the twiddle operator do? Data, so data rep 5a set f0 cute bracket i equal twiddle cute bracket i. Replace lamp, nice. Um, what do you think that does? Yes, I'm sorry, what's your name? Allison. It changes zeros to ones and ones to zeros. What does that sound like visually? Swapping black and white, so one down, seven to go. Nine to go. Okay, let's take a look at data rep 5b. Now uh, now it's sort of like I'm, I'm your Kaplan instructor. Does data rep 5b look easy or hard? Let's skip it. Data rep 5c. Um, data rep 5c, so I should zoom in. So we cast the array to an array of cares and then modify every other care. What does that have, what does that mean visually? What, so this is, th this cute is an array of u at 16 t's. It's an array of 16 bit integers. A care is an eight bit integer. So if I modify every other character so character zero, character two, character four, what does that say about the image where every row of the image corresponds to a 16-bit integer? Yeah, Franklin. It means that one of the sides is gonna stay the same, for sure. So which of these images looks like that? Only one of them does, it's this one. Right, it's certainly not this. <laughs> this is flipping the image from side to side, which is like, that's like a bitwise reversal. 
That's an interesting one. I don't, I'm not sure how to write that. I wonder if it would be complicated to write. Um, this we've taken care of. This looks like the input image, only some bits are masked out. This is real weird, but there's only one bit on in each row. So that doesn't make any sense for what we're looking at right now, which is modifying half of it. This is a vertical flip. So we know that this function is going to look different than the functions that we've been looking at so far. This function is going to be like doing something to more than one row at a time rather than just to one row. Uh, this is the original. This is sort of some sort of weird like slanty distortion type thing. Maybe I might expect a bit shift if I was looking at this. Uh, this, uh, I mean, this is either all zeros or all minus ones. Um, okay, so we have now sort of talked about all of them. Here's a little fact. So this is the right answer. Here's a little factoid about this. So the, 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 of course it's projecting, so I can't possibly make the projection disappear, but, um, there's the boundary. Does that remind you of anything? What's left over? This is the tile pattern in all the Maxwell Dworkin bathrooms. Because the, the Maxwell Dworkin bathrooms have this sort of tile pattern, which is just like the binary integers. If you look at it, zero, nothing is on, then one, then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, do you, see, do you see how that sort of like is binary integers? So yeah, go to the bathroom, take a look. Um, notice that that is in fact what we were assigning those rows to. We were assigning them to the integers from zero to 16. Okay, so that leaves us with the hard one. Uh, I still don't feel like solving this. Okay, so let's take a look at the other ones. We've told that we have that we can match all the other ones with their images. So let's see. What does this one look like it's doing? We're looking at F3. We're now working by process of elimination. F3 has a bitwise and in it. And there's some shifty thing. And there's a twiddly thing. And then the number seven. Talk to me about seven. <laughs> what does seven do for you? It's one less than a power of two, right? So like, you know, a, a power skill for uh, systems programmers is knowing your powers of two. So like seven is one less than eight. Seven is three bits on in a row. So when you take three bits on in a row and you shift it by a row number, you get a sort of a diagonal bar of three bits. If you then flip those three bits, then you get a diagonal mask out. So this image, F3, corresponds to I. Here's the shifty mask that was masked out of Hello Kitty. Okay. F4. What do you think about this? Cute I left shift I divided by four. One of these pictures looked like Hello Kitty was being forced to lean in one direction. In other words, the Hello Kitty's bits were being shifted in one direction. This is image B. So why divided by four? What's the functionality of that in this image? So if we had shifted by I, then every row of Hello Kitty would have been shifted by an additional um, place, which would have made Hello Kitty disappear very quickly. Um, dividing it by four meant the first the first four rows are shifted by zero places. Then the next four rows are shifted by one place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, we can work this out further. Um, F five. 
Negative one times bang, bang. Oh my God, what the heck is this? Well, this is giving us either a zero or a negative one. So this, because bang, bang is like not, not. So not something turns the something into either zero or one, right? So if you have a negative one and you multiply it by either zero or one, then you get either zero or negative one. This is C which is the only image that looks anything like that. So I'm hoping that you're observing that I'm not trying to figure out everything about each of these programs. I'm looking for something that, uh, you know, that corresponds to an image, like some feature that I can correspond visually to an image. So this, this is the only program that's dealing with more than one row at a time. This is the vertical flip. This, this is the bitwise and with a negative number that is actually the one that has the single row of on pixels in it because x and minus x is always only one bit long uh this is i believe xor equals the thing xor itself what is a thing xor itself what's x x or x it's zero and what is x x or zero X. So this is A. This is the original image. This is doing nothing to the image. Someone's like, Pfft. sorry. Um, this is sort of doing an XOR with a constant. So this is uh, flipping a column or a set of columns. It's hard to say exactly what columns, but my guess is that it's image E, which involves flipping a set of columns. That leaves one program which is the complicated program. And the complicated program is in fact the horizontal flip. Um, okay, hopefully that was helpful for you. Yeah, Michaela. It's not. Can I go over assembly number one? Yes. Oh, I'm searching for ASM on the data rep page and angry that it's not showing up. Smart, okay. Um, here's some assembly produced by compiling a C program. Oh my God, there's a lot of assembly. How many arguments might this function have? Ah, okay, well, you and I, we will sit through, we will understand every single instruction as it occurs. At the end of it, we'll know what the function does. We'll translate the function into OCaml and only once we've done that, will be we able to answer this question. Okay, how many arguments might this function have? Circle all that apply, zero, one, two, three, or more. Okay. What's the first argument register? RDI, yes. Its friends are EDI. Uh, and DI and DIB, maybe it's DIL. Do we find a use of RDI in this function that is not preceded by an assignment to RDI? Well, let's take a look. Here's the function. Just sort of quickly tracing this through. Here's the first use of RDI. It sure looks like if this function has an RD, has a argument one, we don't care what it is because we overwrite it immediately. Um, I believe that we would find the same thing about the second argument register, which is RSI. There's an assignment to RSI. Once you see like, you know, all of the registers that are used for arguments, we're overwriting them without checking their values. You know, Occam's razor says, this function has no arguments because it's unlikely that someone would write a function that took, you know, arguments and then just ignored them. It does happen. So we could work through the other four argument registers, but like what I might say at this point is like maybe zero is an answer. And then I would be like, oh, all that apply. Okay. What if there was a first argument, but the function just ignored it? So 
my answer for this is going to be zero, one, two, or three or more. And the reason for that is that you cannot tell that you, when you, when you look at assembly, you only get a lower bound on the number of arguments because arguments that are unused just don't appear in the assembly at all. We've actually seen some uh, examples of that in class, right? There was like some function whose name was like underscore Z one F L L L L L L L L L L L L L. And it looked like a function for incrementing its first argument. That function had like a hundred long arguments that were unused. Um, okay, next part. Uh, what might this function return? Ah, zero, one, minus one, its first argument, whatever that argument is. Well, we've already eliminated one. A square number other than zero or one or none of the above. Okay, so if I want to understand what a function returns, I might, again, start at the beginning and go through to the end, or I might start at the end and work backwards. Here's the return. What does this function return? Seems to return one. Is there any other return in this function? Seems not. I'm going to say that this function returns one. Um, does this help? Okay. Max. Oh my gosh, if you wanted to like type this, oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, you can run the compiler. You can, if you run the compiler and give it an assembly file, it will take that assembly file and turn it into an object file. There is a way to do this. It is unlikely to be the right way to do this for the test. Like, I just, I fear for you wrestling with a compiler and like, I fear for me seeing people taking photos of this and then trying to like get their OCR working on their iPhone because they don't want to type it in. Oh my God. Yes, it will be on paper when we give it to you. Yes. It will be on PDF. I mean, I suppose you can get a PDF and cut and paste. We'll give you access to the PDF. Everybody gets access. Congratulations. Okay, uh, next question. <laughs> yes, Sophie. You are typing your answers. You will type your answers into a Git repository, which you will push at the end of the exam. Uh, Tanner. The last assembly? 1E, okay, maybe. What might this function print? Circle all that apply. Oh God. So um, I only partially remember this problem, but I do remember that this problem was meant to help you get to 1E by doing 1C and 1B. But let's try and do this uh, from the beginning. What might this function print? So it seems to say, it seems to like be giving us a hint that it might be two integers. Of course, there's none of the above in case it won't print any of those things. Why is two integers a right answer for something that this function might print? What is the format to the print? Percent D percent D. Right? That is loaded into the first argument slot for printf here. Okay, so the first argument is the format. So the second argument is going to be the first integer, and the third argument is going to be the second integer. So we are now wondering what are RSI and RDX at this point in the program? Okay. How do we get out of this? So it seems that if we look at this, all of these labels, right? And these labels are this way because this was compiled from an actual C compiler. Th 
this is how we get out of this loop. There is a loop here. This is a backwards jump. This is a backwards jump. So the only way that we get out of this loop is here. So we're jumping if two things are equal. Okay. What are the things that we are jumping if they're equal? The third and fourth arguments. We figured out already that there's zero arguments to this function. So it's not the third and fourth arguments. It's some running variables. It's some temporary variables. Let's call them ESI and EDI and ECX, right? We want to know what's in ESI and what's in uh, ECX, I guess, or EDX. EDX is the third argument, right? So when do we take that jump? So we start off, the relevant instructions here are the, the instructions that I wanna focus on are the first five instructions after LBB03. I'm just gonna rewrite them in C-like syntax. So EAX equals ESI. EAX times equals EAX, right? EAX plus equals EDI. And then we do a comparison between ECX and EAX. And we exit this loop if and only if they're equal. So we want equality. That's it. We do. Okay. So what more can we learn about, like, you know, that's not quite enough information for us. There is something really interesting here that like I'm already thinking about and like I'm kind of lying because I half remember the solution to the problem, but it really is only half. But like this EAX times equals EAX, that looks like a square number, right? So like there's going to be some square something somewhere in this problem. So maybe I'm now looking for other sort of like, you know, intuitions and things to test. So let's say that I do not uh, achieve equality. Um, so instead we go on from here. This jump if less, we're now looking at the next four instructions. This jump if less is gonna take us right back up here. So this is the smallest loop in this code. This is the tightest, smallest loop in this code. There's sort of like some nested loops almost, right? Like this JL LBB02 goes back up there and this jump LBB06 goes way up to the top of the screen, right? So it's like loop, loop, loop. We're now at the narrowest of those loops. So what does it do? It's arranged in an odd order because there's a couple of sort of uh, computations here, but the co this comparison is uh, what we're going to, is, is what we're going to affect, uh, is what JL is going to listen to. So I'm gonna write down what those instructions are doing. I'm doing it in a slightly different order. So EAX equals ESI plus one. It's actually RSI plus one, but doesn't matter. And then ESI equals EAX. Okay, well that's a little weird that we see those two instructions in a row, but that's what they're doing. 
EAX equals ESI plus one, EAI, ESI equals EAX. That's like incrementing ESI. Okay, I'm now going to exit the problem solving mode and tell you why the compiler has decided to do this. Did, does anybody know why the compiler has decided to do this rather than doing increment? It's so stupid, but it apparently is a good optimization because otherwise the compiler wouldn't have it. Increment is an arithmetic operation and arithmetic operations mess with the comparison flags. Address operations like move and LEA do not mess with the comparison flag. This comparison is using the old ESI, not the new ESI. So stupid. But like, if you want to understand what the assembly is doing, Okay, so we increment ESI. And then if the old ESI, so if ESI minus one is less than EDX, go up here. Okay, so we've just sort of like done one uh, one of the narrower uh, the narrowest loop. Anybody sort of like get any in additional intuitions out of this loop? What does this loop look like? Does it look like a while loop or a for loop? So a while loop is going until some condition holds where the condition is not necessarily simply an arithmetic condition. Yeah, Helena. So uh, my question was ill-formed. You're right. It also is a for loop. It's like running ESI from one up until EDX. So for ESI equals one to EDX, compute the square of ESI, add it to EDI, and see if the result equals EAX. So it's like taking a square, summing it to something else, and see if, seeing if that sum equals something else. Okay, I am now growing curious about the things that are invariant across this loop. This loop is modifying ESI, right? The loop is modifying EAX. EAX is not super interesting because it's reset every time. It is not modifying ECX and EDI. Let's take a look at what the values for ECX and EDI are. What do we know about the value of ECX? It is a what kind of number? What do we know about EDI? It is a what kind of number? Okay, so this number is running from one up until n. This number is a square. This number is a square. What is this function looking for? Pythagoras. Somebody said Pythagoras, I think. I stared at them because I didn't really understand it, but yes. This function is looking for solutions to the Pythagorean a squared plus b squared equals c squared equation. Okay, that's what it's looking for. Um, given that, what does it print? It prints the squares. So it prints E D X E D X. Yeah, I believe so. So, which of these might it print? Will print zero zero? No. We'll see that it starts from one. Will print one one? No. That doesn't solve the problem. Will print three four? Yeah. I think that that is the solution to the problem. Hooray.
Okay. Hopefully when you were doing this, it would not be as methodical, um, but that's the kind of process that you can go through to solve this problem. Um, we have time for one more question. No, what's your name? Curly? Why not 6, 8? Does this function have any arguments? It does not have any arguments. That was part A. So it always starts from the same place. And it always increments in the same way. So it finds the smallest solution to the Pythagorean equation and prints out, you know, A and B. Yeah. Coleman. ASM 10. This one, yes. Yes. Will you have to write assembly in general in the exam? You will not have to write assembly in general in the exam. You'll notice that all the solutions to the problems in this in this guy are quite simple. Yeah, yeah. There are some hard ones, yes. I mean, part of what's going on with this particular problem was it, it's about you know a restricted palette. What can you do with a restricted palette of instructions that makes some things harder, but it makes it harder also for you to have syntax errors. But yeah, there will be one question on the exam. It will be write a correct C compiler in assembly. Okay, questions, questions. Sorry, uh, in the back. Cause he, what was your name? Ivan. Ivan. Uh, we want you to have familiarity with the code base. So I think if you've done phase one and gotten started on phase two, that's probably enough. And I believe that you should be able to do that even just given last two lectures. Um, the lecture notes for kernel are partially there, partially not. Um, do go use last year's notes to, to fill it in. Um, other questions? I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Eli, right? Data rep for. Four B. Okay, big endian versus little endian. Okay, printf percent d cute zero. So the thing that you have to remember is that cute is from the previous problem. So let's take a look at cute zero. Cute zero corresponds to this row. Um, okay, so these this problem locates 8-bit numbers horizontally and vertically in the following 16 by 16 image. So cute 0 is 2 to the 9, right? Like that's the only one bit on in this image. It's in column 9. Uh, 2 to the 8 is 256. 2 to the 9 is 512. Okay, so is this particular arrangement of bits little endian or big endian? I think that that question was not asked in the best possible way. Let me try again. Okay, so this is each row here represents two bytes. Let us assume first that the bytes were stored just like they are in the image. So the first byte in the array of shorts represented the eight blank pixels. So that the first byte in the cute array was zero. And the second byte of the cute array had one one bit in it. And the third byte in the cute array had uh, four one bits in it. Does it make, does this, uh, okay, ask questions. I'm saying ask questions because I don't want to say, ask questions or tell me to go on. 
Okay, go on. Okay, so if the bytes were stored this way, like we see in this image, is this machine, would, would the machine be little endian or big endian? My answer is that it would be little endian because bits zero through seven are located in the first byte, right? So the least significant bits are located in the first byte. That's like x86-64, x86-64 is little endian. So if this value, if this, um, if this machine was little endian, then we would expect to see the number 512 or something like it stored in this machine. If this machine were, I, I feel like I'm, I'm muffing this question. If this machine were big endian, right? This machine were stored in a, stored its numbers in a big endian way. Then what would the first byte of the cute array hold? Would it be all zero bits or not? So let's 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 work through this. Uh, okay, let me let me try a, a metaphor, or let me try some other values, and then we'll uh, then we'll have to end. Okay, so if the first row of the image was all zero bits, what would the printout be? I'm using hypotheticals here. It would be zero. Could you tell whether it was little endian or big endian? No. Okay. Um, if the first row of the image was all zeros in the first byte and all ones in the second, Okay, so all zeros in the first byte, all ones in the second. And you printed out an integer on a little Indian machine, what would you expect to see? Let's go back. If I have a byte and it's got all zeros and I print it as a byte, what do I get? Zero. If I have a byte and it's all ones and I print it as a byte, what do I get? 255, 255, okay? So if the first byte in an array of memory is zero and the second byte is 255, and I print out those two bytes loaded as a 16-bit number. And the result is 255. Where are the low, least significant bits stored? In the first byte or the second? So I'm taking 16 bits, printing them as an integer, getting 255. And if the least significant bits are on the right, is this storing numbers in a little endian way or a big endian way? Big endian. In little endian, the least significant bits are on the left. 
okay? So if this were a little endian machine, we would see a number that's bigger than 255, okay? Here, we have a situation where all the one bits are in the second byte. Is the result bigger than 255 or smaller? It's bigger than 255. All the one bits are in the second byte. That tells us it has to be little endian, has to be, okay? Thank you. Good luck. That's it. Goodbye.